you, you know, back in, and especially with this math stuff, you know, back in uh, the early 90s, I was kind of orthogonal to the skater universe, which is, uh, kind of gives you a, an indication of the, the social outcast status that I occupied. And, uh, and I had this really ridiculous haircut. Uh, I mean, it was preposterous. It required a lot of maintenance. So there was like mousse involved and some kind of hairspray, and there was this, sort of this false belief that girls would like this, which is, which is wrong. No, 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 I did fix it. Well, it's because it's just it's, it's the power of my thought killed all my hair. So the... Um, <laughs> But now, you know, I've, I've, been, I've reinvested in the beard, and, uh, and you know, the ball cap used to mess up the hair, and now the mask is just as, is just as deadly. So it's, it's, it's this awful relitigation of, of kind of the worst period of my life. Um, but hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Uh, we're here to talk about what America means today. I know that uh, it was just brought to my attention that we have a, a typo in our, in our program, uh, and it says, what, what, what do Americans mean today? Americans mean freedom. Uh, but America, as, as, as a regime, as a state, as a polity, is, is uh, obviously something that, that we need to talk about. Uh, I want to start with a few thoughts, and then I'll introduce uh, the gentleman who you're really here to uh, hear from, uh, Dr. Matt Peterson. Uh, look, there is a lot of, of, uh, of evidence that things in America don't work the way that they should. And it's an accumulation of small things uh, that you can see and experience in life. And almost everybody notices it on some fashion. Think about the post office. The post office is supposed to work, right? And most of us grew up with a post office working. Well, the post office, uh, particularly in the last six weeks, hasn't really worked that well. It's been a kind of a weird phenomenon. Stuff not getting delivered, packages getting taken. It's not what we expect of systems. You think of the vaccine effort uh, right now, which is slowly rolling out uh, across America. It's obviously the gateway to the end of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and you would think that this would be a functioning job one. Yet acquiring a vaccine, if you are in an eligible population, has become an exercise for the majority of Americans uh, akin to getting a fresh loaf of bread at a Soviet grocery store in 1988. You know, you have to know the right person, log on to the right website, you know, get the right qualifications, find a letter. And it's just, it's not, again, how America is supposed to work. Uh, you know, think also about election administration, uh, you know, which has been done to death, so I won't go over it again here. But again, something that's supposed to work, and for some reason hasn't in the ways that it ought to. Think about the armed forces. Uh, we've been at war in Afghanistan now for 20 years, uh, give or take. Uh, literally, individuals who were not born uh, when that war started are serving in uniform right now uh, at Bagram Air Base, which is crazy. Um, the United States Armed Forces, the F-35, uh, took about a quarter century from design to fielding, which is, which is nuts. But the Armed Forces, although, is very, very good at naming ships after people like Cesar Chavez, Gabby Giffords, and so on. So there's a misplacement of priorities. Think about an average American born in 1990. What would an American born in 19, I'm sure there are some people in this room who were actually born after 1990, which makes me feel incredibly aged. Uh, but uh, so, so your opinions don't count, you're too young and inexperienced. Uh, but, uh, but if you're born in 1990, what did an American infant in 1990, what could that child expect out of his or her life? There was every reason to believe they were on the cusp of a golden age of American greatness because the Cold War had just been won, democratic capitalism was ascendant throughout the world, and the United States was, as the French say, the hyperpower. There was nothing we couldn't do. But here's what actually happened to our hypothetical American born in 1990. At age 11, this child sees 9-11, and a war starts that continues on to this day. At age 18, when this individual is making the choice to either go to college or enter the workforce, the worst market crash and recession since the Great Depression happens. If this child, no longer a child, chooses to go to college, at age 22 in 2012, they enter the workforce into a very anemic, and underperforming workforce that doesn't really pick up again until the Trump administration in late 2017. Uh, and now, this hypothetical individual is 31 years old. This person is uh, probably, you know, if they're like the plurality, delaying marriage, may not have had kids yet, uh, family formation is, 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 is slowed or even stopped, there's difficulty in owning a house, uh, there's difficulty in, they, they, they've probably gotten a higher education to some extent, but it is ruinously expensive and loading them with, uh, with unsustainable debt. And so, and so there is this sense, again, that for this generation, and by the way, uh, the millennials plus Gen Z are the largest generations in American history, so these are very consequential individuals, uh, uh, that they, they haven't seen America work the way that we have. I was born in 75, I saw America work. I saw America, and I remember it, winning the Gulf War, which my father fought in, winning the Cold War, seeing the Reagan administration. Where are the memories for the... For the That's a problem. I'll close with this with the opening, uh, and then I want to introduce uh, my colleague here, Dr. Peterson. There, there was a very good article in The Atlantic. Actually, it was the only good article in The Atlantic uh, <laughs> last week. And I forget who the author was, because uh, uh, it, it doesn't matter. 
but it was about The Simpsons. Who watched The Simpsons? Everybody knows what The Simpsons is, right? Yes, okay. Well, I guess just Steve has watched The Simpsons. The Simpsons is a cartoon family, uh, but since we're making, that's the basis on which policy is made these days, we'll use them as an example. The Simpsons came on Fox in, gosh, when was it? 1990, right? Yeah, it would have been about 90. It was about 1990. Mm -hmm. think, think, I'm sorry? Who's saying 88? Paul? Okay. All right. Well, uh, then I guess we had the same social life back then because, uh, yeah, it was, it, it was 88. Uh, so, so the Simpsons come on in 88. Think about it. By the way, 1980 was a long time ago, folks. And it doesn't feel like it, but it really was. Uh, think about the lifestyle of the Simpsons. And now remember, the Simpsons at the time was intended as a parody of the average American family. Homer Simpson supports a family of five, wife, two kids, and his dad, on a job that does not require a college education. He's a high school graduate. Uh, and he uh, essentially has infinite job security. That lifestyle is unattainable now. When The Simpsons debuted, it was intended to be an exposition on the lower middle class that no longer exists. So, 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 so think about that. Uh, I'm not here to paint a picture of pessimism for you because we're going to talk about kind of the analysis of, of, of what it is. But, but the idea that America is not working, I would, I would posit, is indicative of a larger challenge in the American state and the regime under which we live. And for that, for an exposition of that, for an explanation of that, I want to turn to Dr. Peterson. Let me introduce him real quick. Dr. Matthew Peterson, uh, uh, a friend of mine, a friend of the foundations, uh, one of the brightest minds, I think, out there uh, in the public square today, uh, right, left, center, doesn't matter which niche you're talking about. He is a man to whom you must listen uh, because he's frequently three steps ahead of what's happening, not just on the news, but in society. Uh, he's vice president of education at the Claremont Institute and founding editor of The American Mind. The American Mind, an online publication uh, that also has a very dynamic, not just podcast, but like eight podcasts now. It's, it's, a, it's kind of a podcast universe, uh, to which I strongly encourage you to listen. Um, graduate of Thomas Aquinas College, uh, a PhD in political science from Claremont Graduate University. Uh, and so you've taught at the School of Public Policy at Pepperdine, Loyola Marymount, Claremont McKenna, among others. Uh, and from 2008 through 2011, uh, you assisted in the design, implementation, and evaluation at uh, Department of Education funded teaching American history initiatives. So Matt's been in the field for a while. I'll tell you one last thing about him. You know, he, uh, he's, he's bringing himself, his political consultancy, his media consultancy to Texas. He's, he's coming from California. He's joining us in the Dallas area, uh, yeah. I believe. And uh, so, so, so you picked uh, the second best place to go uh, in Texas. <laughs> um, but we're really just absolutely thrilled uh, to have you here as a new Texan. New Texans are the best Texans. And I say that as a native Texan. Um, so thank you for joining us, first of all, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Peterson to our panel. Yeah, thank you. It's, um, <clears throat> it's wonderful just be, to be close to the physical presence of your brain, pushing that hair out. Oh, it's very good. <laughs> um, Josh is, uh, is great, and, uh, and what, he, uh, what he does and what he thinks about it is really important stuff. Uh, it's true, uh, we are going to, myself and my family are going to be, like many others, leaving California uh, and coming here. Um, my sole interest in Texas politics is to keep Texas, Texas, <laughs> and to radicalize your leaders to make sure that that happens. Um, and I don't think I'm the only one. Um, it, it almost feels like uh, it's to the point where people will say it feels like being in a foreign country uh, when you go in and out of red states and blue states right now. And if you've traveled at all this year, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's wild the way that's unfolded. Um, I. I really think that what Josh started with is important because there is a, a kind of age problem, right? We, we live in two different universes. The picture that, that you, you painted, I think, accurately um, is just unknown to you if you were born at, you know, you're older. You have seen a completely different world, and you've seen that world um, slowly, like a frog in a pot, disappear. So. One of the things that, that, um, that scares me a, a little bit is when I go to Washington, D.C. and talk to people who run big conservative outfits and, you know, we're on the right, and I know that if I talk to anyone there under 30, they won't believe half the stuff that goes on there, and they'll have all kinds of radical ideas of what really needs to be done. And I would suggest that's because they actually see the landscape. They see the landscape of the situation we're in much clearer than some people who've been doing this for a long time and are repeating the same the slam slogans over and over again in Washington, D.C. Oh, and in case you haven't noticed, there's a crisis of leadership right now on the right. Uh, and there's very few people willing to, uh, willing to stand up uh, for various things. So this disjunction is dangerous. Um, when you have uh, a set of people who really don't appreciate the landscape 
and then you have you know, younger people who do, and they're speaking past each other, that's, that's very dangerous. Uh, but, but probably what's even more on our minds today is the larger divide uh, in America and, and you know, what's wrong with the regime, what, what, is it, uh, what does America mean now? Um, the central and most obvious you know, first point, uh, but it can't be emphasized enough, is that we don't teach, of course, what you and I think America means. And we've talked about this for 50, 60 years. William F. Buckley writes, God and man at Yale when he leaves and says there are a bunch of godless communists here. <laughs> this is a problem. Um, many reports, we had the big report in the 80s. We knew that education was getting worse and worse. But, but quite frankly, we're at the point now of uh, a kind of institutional collapse in education. Right? You're, you're seeing, what you're seeing now is a recognition on the part of the American people that this system just doesn't work. Uh, so for the first time in the last few years, very significant, over 50% of Americans don't trust higher education anymore. They know that something's wrong with the system itself. As far as answering that question, what you would learn from your actual teachers, now obviously we learn from culture and everything else, but what you learn from your actual teachers, whose job it is to answer that question, uh, we realize right, what, what you're going to learn. You're going to learn that um, America is uh, not just a flawed country, but an intrinsically flawed country, right? an, evil, an evil country, and therefore needs to be radically remade. Um, it is an unjust regime, and therefore uh, violence in the streets is justified. I mean, the argument to, uh, to um, approve of political violence on the left is already baked in for an entire generation of people. Right. The justification is there because the injustice is there, in, is there and the injustice is structural, it's systemic. And that is what the, really the entire education establishment has been teaching for a long time. And so, so you know, answering that question, I mean, we know what the other, how the other side answers it, and now we're at the point where uh, you can see the kind of actions uh, that, will, that will take place to change the, the structure and the system in a way that uh, will be argued as more equitable or just. Right. And, and so this is, th that, that, that's, that's the, this is fundamental though, right? I mean, there's a, the American government is a Republican form of government. Josh said the word regime, right? What kind of government do we have? We have a Republican form of government. Uh, it's based on certain principles, the idea that human beings are intrinsically uh, equal, right? We're in, not equal in all respects, but there's some intrinsic uh, dignity to the human being. It makes us all equal. We shouldn't be governed without other people's consent, the Declaration of Independence. I mean, is that, is that still the case? Do, can people explain what that means? No, the Declaration of Independence is an evil document written by uh, a number of slave owners, and it's a kind of a shoddy principle. And in fact, we don't want equality under the law, right? We want to divide America into various groups and establish a hierarchy among them that will then be enforced by our woke overlords. I mean, that's a simple way of describing what the actual philosophy is that's, that's driving this stuff. So what, you, what we have to understand is that this is a regime-level crisis because it relates to the very structure of Republican government. You can't have Republican government without a citizenry that understands uh, you know, what, what it means to be a citizen. That's already been, been functionally or effectively taken away. You don't have that anymore. You have, it's diminishing returns as you get younger and younger, right? You're not, you, don't have, you don't have that anymore. So you don't even have the basic knowledge of, of how Republican government works or what it is. That's already gone. Uh, and, but but um, you also have an ideology that wants to remake that regime because they see it as fundamentally unjust. And it, you know, this is, so this is, in, in the history books, I mean, this is when you would say, you would say that the American regime is about to change, right? It's about to change its character. Rome is about to go from, uh, you know, from being a republic to being ruled by a Caesar. That's, that's what I'm suggesting is the level of change that we're seeing. And we need to start being honest about this. I, I, I find that um, you know, on the right, in the professional right, there's sort of two-track conversations. There's one track where, yes, we have our slogans and policies, and we're talking about really with small ball stuff compared to what I just laid out. If you believe what I just laid out, you would want much more radical solutions, much more radical action, much bolder leadership, much bolder rhetoric, right? But we kind of go about our business and, and speak all this language as, as things start to fall apart. And then there's the other conversation that people are having all across the country, uh, you know, very intelligent folks, all walks of life, who are saying things like, this country really seems like it's falling apart. How long will it stay together? 
And we need to, we need to bring that, that deeper discussion out into the open. And we need to st get much more realistic about what it would take to actually solve some of these problems. So let's be explicit about the, uh, yeah. and, and tell, me, tell me if you dissent from any of this, uh, yeah. uh, although I don't think you do, but let's be explicit about kind of the three premises that the other side mm -hmm. advances about the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, premise number one is that the United States was founded in iniquity for iniquitous reasons. Uh, that the American Revolution happened, uh, as Nicole Hannah-Jones memorably put it, before she was forced to issue a uh, half-hearted correction that uh, the American Revolution was fought to preserve slavery, mm -hmm. which is a lie. Uh, so that's premise number one. Premise number two is that the original founding iniquities uh, persist to this day and continue to be the dominant shaping force in the nation. Premise number three is that the nation is, by virtue of its founding, by virtue of the persistence of iniquity, fundamentally unreformable, which therefore leaves you with no alternative but revolution and overthrow. Do you concur with that? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, yeah, I agree with that, and and that's what justifies the kind of actions we're seeing, where it goes far beyond, um, you know, passing laws. You're talking about using the most powerful forces in the country, and we should say, the right doesn't own any of those, right? I mean, what institutions do we have? They have education, they have media, they have the largest and most powerful corporations in the world, and all of those things are being utilized, turned all the way up to 11, as the saying goes, mm -hmm. to, uh, to push um, this kind of thing outside of any law being passed at all. Can we drill down on one of those elements? Uh, yeah. you, know, you know, historically there's been the cliche, which I think has always been overstated, that big business and corporate power is inherently of the right. And so you get, uh, you know, historians like Heather Cox Richardson, who writes this really terrible newsletter that I subscribe to, uh, talking about how it's just it's just big business that's going out there, and so this idea that the monopoly guy is out there being the being the and, and if he is the sustainer of conservatism, by the way, give him my number. But uh, you know, but what we've actually seen is large corporate power, uh, particularly in the past decade, uh, very much align uh, on on the on the side of the progressive agenda, on the side of the critics of America, on the side of the left. Can you shed some light uh, and offer some thesis on why that is? Yeah, I mean. Um the cause is, um, is uh, you know, there was a few causes, right? But what, let's, just, let's just get clear on where we're at. We now live in a situation in which uh, every major corporation in America this summer issued official statements, right, taking a stand in regards to the riots and protests. Uh, many of them told their, the largest institutions in America, right, on the private side, told their employees what they could think and what they couldn't think. Um, and this is, you know, th this is outside of your regularly scheduled uh, struggle sessions and woke propaganda that large corporations now, on a regular basis, like force all the employees to have to sit through. So they went out of their way, right, to really put out PR statements and to say what they were going to do for what I would just call the party. Right, for, for BLM and for the entire movement. And what just happened this week? Every major corporation put out statements uh, saying, and what happened there at the Capitol was bad and we need more than just to prosecute those people. We need to take even more action to deal with this. They put out a statement again, signaling that they were in line with the party. What kind of regime is that? What kind of? What kind of government is that? I mean, yeah, we need to get realistic about, about where, where we stand. I mean, that just happened. So, you know, wh there's a certain point at which the why doesn't matter, right? People in the Soviet Union all knew that they were being lied to, but it didn't matter because no one was going to be able to do a damn thing about it. And we have to think about you know, what could be done uh, to get out from around this. I will say there are certainly a lot of people in C-suites who are acting out of kind of both fear, but also just, you know, I'm gonna move on in five years and I just don't wanna to have to deal with this, so I'm just gonna sign off with whatever the cool thing is and we're gonna get, get over with this. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a lot of people, uh, especially at, at like a medium-sized level, who, uh, you know, are very much against what's going on. Mm -hmm. But again, what can you do? Uh, you know, what, what can you do? And in order to do something, you would need leaders that are sort of activists, right? You need kind of organizations that would unite, maybe new trade associations and this kind of thing. And you would also need political leaders who are willing to say something about it that people could kind of hide behind, right? But when you don't have that, you just have uh, everyone cowed and moving in the same direction because the energy and the power is all on one side. 
You know, one thing that, uh, that you and I have talked about uh, and is, is directly relevant to this is the idea that there are not just career consequences, but, uh, you know, family support consequences mm -hmm. for diverging from the herd. You know, I think a, a good friend of mine at McKinsey, and, you know, McKinsey is, is kind of the upper stratosphere of uh, the consultancy universe. So, you know, like Gulf Emirates hire McKinsey to tell them that they need to change the window shades or something like that. Um, but uh, but M McKinsey, uh, which which uh, you know moves billions of dollars uh, and is 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 a well respected firm, uh, issued copies of the book White Fragility to all of its workers, uh, all of its uh, personnel back in uh, sometime in the summer. I forget uh, when exactly it was, but there was the expectation, especially if you were uh, you know heading on the partner track, that uh, that you had to read this thing, internalize it, and believe it. It was an issuance of an ideological um, uh, directive that's, uh, that's pretty chilling in, in the space of the American workplace. But look at, the, at, the, at, at, at kind of the pressures on somebody, let's say, again, generating your, our hypothetical 31-year-old uh, millennial. So this, this, this individual, man or woman, doesn't matter. 31 years old, perhaps, uh, perhaps has a family to support, um, perhaps, you know, perhaps has a kid who needs food or there's a parent who needs taken care of. Uh, how do you ask that person to effectively end their career or to take an income hit and directly affect the ability to put uh, food uh, in, in if, what was it, put food on our children, was that the old phrase? Uh, but you know, put, put, put food on the table uh, you know, for your family uh, in, in, in fealty to some ideal of, of, of what America's ought to be. Uh, you can't blame ordinary individuals uh, for acquiescing to the machine uh, in that case. It's a very difficult thing to go into opposition. Um, what do we do to make it possible for people to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, let me I mean, let me add to that. I mean, if you're if you're in managerial status or higher status at right a lot of these places, I don't know how many people understand what that world is like. But there are there are major corporations where you will make more money right by diversity, by following diversity hires, et cetera. I mean, you directly will just get more money. In fact, one um, and of course, there are definitions of minorities or protected. You know, is always changing. But if you had a, a business owned by some demographic that was on the good list, and you did a contract, you do a contract with them, you sign them up, you, I mean, you just get a percentage. So you're incentivized to pay certain businesses more, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, that, that's the level at which we're talking. This is built into the system. Um, I think, um, I'll just tell you something coming out of the wild personal experience of the last nine months. Um, and why I have, I have some hope and, and there's a direction in which um, things are turning that, that might assist us. But as I warn you, it's a little radical. Um, I, what's happened now is that half of the country sees itself um, as one, right? I mean, it has an identity really in a way through Trump. Trump is the unifying symbol of half of the nation that feels more embattled than they ever have. And that's not, that's not gonna change, that's only gonna those screws are just going to tighten. So what you see, how does this play out? Well, you see millions of people trying to go to parlor before it's shut down. You see, I mean, I have, you know, there's grandparents now saying, how, how the heck do I get off to Facebook and what do I use now, right? There's a demand, in other words, with no advertising for a product, let's put it in business terms, that doesn't really exist. Uh, and and parlor, you know, does exist, got persecuted. Um, think about Fox News as well. Think about Fox News as ratings, right? I mean, whether you agree or disagree with their coverage, millions of people stopped watching Fox News. They're not being served. My hope would be that we have a lot of talented professionals who are embedded in the system, in finance and tech especially, as where I, I know them and, and come to meet them, who are quietly, furtively, you know, reading the American mind and, and talking to me about the state of the world, and you know, they, they're not thinking very happy thoughts. Um, but these are people who now, it, it's so bad, they're looking to, uh, to move out. And I think if, if you have half the country plus as a market, because a lot of these products everyone would want, everyone would want privacy. If I, if I guarantee you, you know, I can give you a phone that you won't be tracked, um, there's a, people are going to buy it, right? I mean, so, so it's not just half of America, but it's especially that half of America. This is not being served. Now, uh, I'm speaking like a libertarian, even though I've never been one, but I really think this is true. If half the country is a market, that is actually something that will draw the kind of talent that we need to build new things that are needed to take action uh, in a much bolder and quicker way than we have been in the past. And I certainly see the willingness. Um, I've, I've talked to a lot of people um, secretly, you know, quietly behind the scenes, and 
I, there are a lot of talented people who, if you had the idea for a kind of business that's needed or a kind of activist organization that's needed, they see what's needed, they're ready to go, they're, they're willing to, uh, to do it. But again, there's a disconnect, I think, in our world between leadership and our older organizations and then you know, the, the younger or middle-aged talent that wants to go uh, fight this stuff. So there is a willingness to get out on the part of a minority of people, but mm -hmm. a significant minority in these, uh, say, let's call them professional class uh, you know, jobs, and they do want to come to a place where they can, you know, they can build. Um, and, and so that, I think, is the silver lining in all of this. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, one of the things that I like about the institution that you run, uh, particularly the podcast, but the publication as a whole, The American Mind, is, uh, is that it, it serves as kind of a validating permission structure. It gives permission to say the things that, that we actually think. And I'll tell you my story with it. Uh, uh, and again, I knew I knew Matt before this. We were uh, internet friends. I think yeah. it'd be yeah, which is uh, condemnation again of, <laughs> of kind of how I form relationships. But uh, the uh, the you know back, back when uh, the riots started in in May June uh, 2020, uh, which is a million years ago, uh, you know I was I was aghast at at what I saw of it. You know one of the things if you're if you're a student of American history, if you're a student of Chinese history uh, in particular, you could see what was happening. Uh, with uh, with with the riots that were going on, um, you know, real grievances uh, that kind of sparked the thing. But the fundamental character of it, uh, which I think was only affirmed as 2020 went on, was that it was it was effectively an insurrectionary movement. It was an insurrectionary movement uh, designed to effectively overthrow the American way of life with the active complicity of lots and lots of local office holders, governors, mayors, uh, predominantly but not exclusively Democratic. Uh, and so, and, and I was I was stunned by it. And one of the great things about when I when I stumbled on, I guess it might have been when you started. I don't know when your first podcast was, but it was early on. And I listened to an American Mind podcast on the way to work one day, and uh, and it was it was Matt and Ryan and James, and and they said exactly these things. And uh, and I thought I thought, my gosh, you know what? It's not just me. There's other people out there who 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 were who were viewing this with with clarity. Of course, I would describe my views to be clear, but uh, you know, there, there's other people who are viewing this with clarity, who understand it in the same way, uh, and who hold the same apprehensions and concerns and values that I do. And I can't overstate the value of just establishing those connections. It's very lonely out there in a way that deters action without the connections. And so I think one of the values of what you do, one of the values of this policy orientation is, is establishing those networks, letting you know that there's others out there who still believe in the America that we actually grew up in. So I don't know if you have thoughts on that. Uh, oh, yeah. Can, yeah. Well, I think that's vital to keep, you know, for everyone to stay sane uh, <laughs> during these times. Um, you need to uh, keep keep friends close and uh, and find people to associate with, especially younger people. Uh, ask about this all the time because they feel uh, completely isolated and atomized. And obviously, that's the goal. That's the plan. The whole point is you're not supposed to. No one in this room is supposed to be able to talk freely with e with each other about their political views. That's why we have to get rid of parlor. That cannot happen. We cannot have. Red State America communicating freely. That is a danger, and that is what drives a lot of what we see. So the, that goal is to, to atomize, to take everyone and make them feel isolated, when in fact, of course, it's, it's representative of half of the country. And that's why uh, you see the reaction you do to what happened at the Capitol, the, the, over, the overreaction. I mean, the, the, the message of the last year, I think, is very clear for half of the country. And it's, we can go out and protest, and commit acts of political violence, and it is justified. If you think about doing that, you are all a bunch of Nazis, and you, we should watch you because you're, you're politically violent uh, individuals who should get the, the full weight of the, the law thrown at them. Right? I'm not talking about what happened at the Capitol was not good. Those people should be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Right? Absolutely. But what I'm saying is the message that the rest of America got is clear. And notice how few leaders are speaking up about it. I mean, it's obvious hypocrisy, right? Just happened right there. All of America sees it. They see the asymmetry. They know what they know. They know what the message is. But the question is, it doesn't matter. It, again, we can we can know that it's it's hip, hypocritical. If, if we can't do anything about it, you know, what does it matter? They win, and that the message is very clear. And it's about it's about it's about power. Um, very much so. Now, with with um, bringing people together, this is important though to get things done. And I think I, I would just say. If you're, you know, if you're sitting here listening, thinking, yeah, yeah, I agree with some of this, you have to take action now uh, to, to reorient yourself in a radically different landscape. And that means shaking things up. That means shaking up probably maybe even the people you, uh, you associate with, you support. You need to rethink 
what you're doing in this landscape where we really do have a regime level crisis. We really are, the stakes are indeed very, very high. And so just some prosaic examples would be, take education, which we, which we started out talking about. Mm -hmm. um, why, so this is what drives me nuts. I mean, education is a problem because they're teaching all this stuff. They're teaching that, you know, that America's bad and uh, it's intrinsically bad. And we all know that it's a problem. And so just think about the way we think and the problem with it. I'm all for charter schools. I'm all about vouchers. I'm all about, I mean, I'm 150% in. But if there's something missing in that argument that makes us losers, what would winners do? Especially if they're in a state that is Republican. They would tell the public schools what they should be doing, right? I mean, they would focus on saying, no, the K through 12 system is the American people's and it's the, the people of Texas, this is their system. Why is it that in a state that's so Republican, and it's, not, it's everywhere, right? It's all red state America. Why is it that we're still dealing with this kind of crap education, like this kind of propaganda in our schools? And, and I would say, so, so, so what do you do if you realize that's the problem? You would have a lot, I mean, just think about the radical proposals that, that, we, would, that we would put forth in the legislature if we took this seriously. Well, we'd look at the, how do you credential people who teach uh, history and civics, uh, right? Let's, let's change the way that looks. And I, I, it's really disheartening to me when I hear people, I, I go off on this, you know, this rant, and people say, well, I mean, we can't, we can't tell the school system what to teach. <laughs> <laughs> well, someone's going to tell them what to teach, and someone Too has contrary. for 50 years, and now we're in this situation. So, so the only way out is, is going to be uh, you know, a, a variety of a bold policy proposals that I do believe, I have hope we're going to see increasingly, um, increasingly across the country that can serve as models that, act, that, that aren't just repeating the same mantras and doing the same thing over and over again, but that really are addressing the reality of the landscape that we are now in. And this is something we can do. There's no reason we, we cannot uh, put, our, put our heads together and think in a much bolder way about what needs to be done. Uh, one, more, one more thing, and then we're, we're about to go into Q&A. Uh, and hopefully there's a lot of Qs, and we can provide some A's uh, to go with that. Uh, and I think you know, it seems like half of you might be ready to invest in concrete and tank traps for your yard. So <laughs> let's give you some reason for hope uh, on this. There's a, there's a lot out there that falsifies. Idea. What's that? Well, from not an that aesthetic perspective, wrong with that. yeah, no, 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 there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm just saying, you know, it's good. but you should do it because it's beautiful, it's true. right? Uh, there, there is reason for hope out there, uh, and, 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 and Matt, I, wanna, I, wa I want you to close uh, with your reasons for hope, um, and, and maybe it's just that you're moving to Texas, which is an acceptable answer, uh, but, uh, you know, what, what, one thing that I, will, that I will posit as a reason for hope is actually, believe it or not, the 2020 elections. Because one of the things that you know, we, we led with talking about the premises of the left and the progressive left and, and, and their attack on America and the critique on America, and it's fundamentally a, a racial critique. There's no other way around it. It's, it's, it's grounded in, in, in effectively, not, uh, not exclusively, but mostly race and ethnicity-based uh, grievances. And so there's this idea that that's going to be the immutable thing that's baked into the system that's going to forever keep you and whomever else down and that you've got to atone for it. If, uh, if, if you're the wrong skin color or ethnicity. Now, as, 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 as a white Mexican, uh, I get to enjoy the fruits of all that, so it's, it's, really, it's really nice. But, uh, but, but, but it's horrible for the country. And, and so, but, but you know, the, what, what, is, what is falsified by the 2020 outcomes, which I thought was so interesting, was what you've, you probably have all already heard in some fashion, which is that none of that analysis turned out to be true. And you can just, you, you can't look, you can look at the Trump vote uh, for it. I think the Trump vote is the most stark uh, illustration of it, but it's not the only illustration of it. Look at what happened in South Texas, where, you know, largely Spanish speaking, largely, you know, ethnic Mexican voters, uh, you know, shifted right in, in massive numbers. Look at the African American vote, which is still super majority Democratic, but nevertheless shifted right in significant numbers. Look at what happened, particularly in rural areas. This is pretty interesting. The Democrats, uh, at, at whatever level, really ran up the score in terms of their votes in concentrated, dense urban areas. But when you had rural and non-dense uh, uh, areas uh, in the country, so I'm thinking particularly about you know, places like Indian reservations, small towns, uh, and this is true throughout the country, the higher the level of diversity, this is so fascinating, the higher the level of diversity, the higher level, basically we're talking about a non-white population, the better Donald Trump did in an arena like that. And what does that tell us? It tells us the dividing line is not actually along race. It's along class and prosperity. 
And that's such an array of hope for us because those are issues on which we can win in the long term. Matt, I want you to have the last word on this. Yeah, I have to think real hard about hope. No, um, I do think, <laughs> I, do think uh, I do think there is a, a very strong uh, reason to hope, or at least a, a thread a path, a path forward, to put it that way. Um, and um, I'll start this way. I mean, let you in on a secret. Uh, American Mind is a little website we started that's done, done, done OK in the last two years. Um, and the secret to American Mind is very simple. As Josh said, we talk about things that everyone's thinking about, but they're too afraid to talk about. And in that kind of environment, your competitive advantage to get ahead right, is getting out in front of everyone. If you get out in front of everyone, uh, then all of a sudden you, you have an audience that gravitates towards you right away. That's really what Donald Trump did. right? He said things like, I don't think the Iraq war went so well, which is still, to this day, something you're not supposed to say in, in DC think tanks. And uh, you know, all of Washington, DC thought, oh my gosh, he's going to lose. And you know, the American public thought, well, yeah, of course. We've all come to that conclusion now at this point in time. And so, so in other words, in that kind of environment, to, to get out ahead, to start things really fast, uh, the, the high octane you know, public is there. The demand for the, kind of thing, the kinds of things we need and the, and the kind of leaders we need is only going to grow as they put the screws to half the country. So what that means is you can scale up really fast. And if you, you come up with a good idea, people will copy it right all over. If you, if you came up with a, a model legislation, we're now in an environment where there'll be a lot of people, especially after 2022, there's going to be a lot of people who will imitate it and pick up, pick up the charge. And I just personally, when I speak to uh, you know, a variety of people around the country, the burst of energy that we're seeing in the next, in, 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 because of these last you know, terrible few weeks is astounding. There's a ton of people, I, I count myself among them, who just are at the point where they're, gonna, they're saying, we know it needs to be done, we're going to go do it. I mean, I mean I'm going to start a firm that will, uh, that will be building a lot of the things that I think we need uh, as well as, uh, as running the American mind when I, when I come to, uh, to the Dallas area. Um, I know a lot of people who, there's a young man in this audience over there who has, uh, is, is starting an organization that's going to uh, be helping educate a new generation of leaders who are ready and hungry to, and, and ready to go. So you know, it, it, we don't have a lot of the institutions, but we do have a, a lot of desire, um, a demand on the part of the American people for the leaders, projects, and institutions that we need. And I think if we have any hope at all, that's it. That's it. That's the source of it. Outstanding. Thank you. We'd uh, we'll go into Q&A. Now, I think, uh, what, a minute early, Caroline? So yeah, very good. Look at that, on time. Uh, we've, got, we've got microphones here. Are, uh, Seth, are, are you the only man with a microphone? Or do, do we have a, a, a multiplicity? Ah, I'm Brent. OK, very good. So um, uh, as, as uh, an example of our commitment to excellence, we actually have a man with a PhD uh, holding a microphone here. So that's just that's the level that the Texas Public Policy Foundation delivers. Thank you uh, both. Uh, uh, so if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll call on you. Ma'am, you'll be first. Uh, but uh, ground rules, please uh, make the question a question. I understand the allure of a microphone in front of one's face. Uh, but uh, uh, short, sweet questions so we can maximize the time. And uh, oh, and by the way, the gentleman, uh, Seth and Brent, will both be holding the mic for you. So please, go ahead. Yeah. That's fine. OK, so I'm a homeschool mom of 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, at first, we Goodness raised Grace, our, yeah. that deserves applause. Our family um, <laughs> has been raised in three different states because, you know, it's a span of 25 years. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we were born and raised, my husband and I, in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. California. I went to UCLA. He went to San Jose State. Um, and we survived as conservatives through K through college, publicly educated. Mm -hmm. um, but we fled, of course. Eventually, you have to flee, um, especially when the Ninth Circuit decided that uh, Parents have no right to direct the education of their own children. So uh, how do you see, in light of COVID and all this virtual learning and so many people now being forced to homeschool, how can we harness that as a way to also make fundamental changes in the public education system? Because now parents are aware of what their children are being taught and how radical it is. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is such a good question. And it's, it's one of the, my top five things, the trends that people aren't talking about and not, not utilizing. Um, because this, this is just visceral for people. So it doesn't matter, you're Republican, lean right, left, whatever. You have this problem where the schools are, are being you know, insane, in my opinion, and their reaction to, to the virus in many places. I mean, 
uh, I haven't even talked to my, my children about Gavin Newsom much, but they, they, figured out, they figured out long ago that they don't like the man. Um, I heard them talking about him the other day. Uh, I blame him for, for what's going on in their lives. But uh, look, there are, there are many ways in which to harness this. Um, and it's, it's, it's tied to uh, uh, the domestic migration that we're going to continue to see. You know, I, I have sad news for all of you. They're not going to stop coming. Right? The, 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 the trend is only going to accelerate. You still have millions of people who are holding on, who actually are doing well economically in somewhere like California, who at this point now, it's an ideological move where they're going, I can't, I can't handle this anymore. Right? It's not just the people looking for a better life over the last 10, 20 years. What you're seeing now uh, is a, a conscious decision on the part of many to say, I can't, I can't live in this regime anymore. So, and that's very much tied to this educational problem. So the question is, how do you sort the, the people you want, right? I mean, this is a question that is very serious. There's all kinds of stuff that could be done, and education is key for it. Now, I, I, think, um, I, I think that the, uh, there's, never, there's never been in my lifetime anyway this awareness on the part of parents about the, uh, the corruption of the K through 12 system. So now is the time to promote new solutions. And I, I think that uh, you know, the charters are great. There's a lot that could be done there. The rhetoric, I think, needs to address the situation we're in. People need to consciously tie um, the, 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 uh, the alternative forms of education we're about to uh, this issue and make their pitch, because the parents are listening. Now, ultimately, I think we need an activist movement that helps organize these parents. This is what the left would do, and they would win. They would organize the parents in the country who are angry into activist groups, get them to show up to school districts and start complaining, you put some money behind it so you have organizers, right? And then you take that movement to a whole nother level after this is over, right? You, you, you have a whole new movement of, of parents who are pissed off and they're, they're, they've learned something about activism and they've gone and complained to their school districts about these issues. And that, then that activist movement would coordinate with organizations like the think tanks, right? And like our friends, the, the few friends we have in the media. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't, I mean, that's one of many projects that, that needs to happen. Um, but it does kill me as well because this is an opportunity of a lifetime to create an activist movement that really could do some serious uh, uh, damage uh, to the other side and really positively help education in America in a way that we haven't been able, uh, able to, you know, we'd accomplish something we haven't been able to accomplish in a long time. Let me add an asterisk to that too. A, a, a functioning institutional conservatism writ large would have already done this. Would yeah. have perceived the market need, yeah. to Matt's point, that you're, that, that you're articulating rightly and, uh, and, and already acted because we're a year into this crisis. And uh, you know, aside from fits and starts, uh, you know, TPPF, um, you know, we're, we're, we're active on it, but uh, it, it takes more than just us. Yeah. Ma'am. Yeah. Um, They'll come with the, the mic, sorry. So, um, there are are you aware of the, and what do you think is the impact of the organizations that are reaching out to younger people, things like Turning Point, uh, I'm a, affiliated with PragerU, we have Prager Force, we're, and, that are get, and Young Americans for Liberty that's so active. Um, where are you seeing, is that the kind of thing you're talking about that are giving safe places mm -hmm. for conservative youth to train them up, mobilize them, and turn them into activists. Is that the kind of thing that you're looking to see grow, or how does that fit within your paradigm? Yeah, good question. Um, I think there's a lot of good work on the part of all those uh, people and organizations you're talking about. Um, I think the next level, though, is not just networking people together. Um, uh, it's not just networking people together on college campuses, but putting them to work uh, for kind of cutting edge or you know bold policies, right? So it's how are you going to marshal those troops? That's that's my question. So it's a good thing to get people together on college campuses. That's incredible, um, but to what end? And there needs to be, um, I think, uh, more spe specificity there. There needs to be specific ends, like they need and. Uh, and that needs to be tied to a larger political movement. But so look, I think I don't want to say anything bad about those organizations. I think they're doing incredible work, and they're essential. Um, but there's a next step, right, uh, to putting people to work or in position to building organizations. And it, it's not just, it's, it's, the basics are 
yes, we, we will have videos on the internet that hopefully don't all get censored, right? <laughs> that's good, we need more of that, um, that's important. Uh, and you know, we have college kids getting together um, you know, on college campuses and networking and you know, being able to be who they are safely with each other, right? And that's great. But I think, um, I think it's where, where do you go from here, right? So the next step for media would be not just explain it, the videos, which are incredible, like they're one of the greatest successes that we've seen in, in, a, in a long time. Uh, but why don't we, we need more media outlets that do more than just comment on the other side. Um, you know, we need to build towards actually having, you know, God forbid we had journalism, right? I mean, most of our outlets comment on the real journalism, quote unquote, that happens at these large legacy places. I mean, we need, we're gonna need a whole new, uh, you know, parallel institutions everywhere. And so I would just say those are great, but we need more, right? And they need to develop in a more st a strategic direction, if that makes sense. Next question, this gentleman here. Uh, so I'm curious, so we're talking about education is pretty much the only ish, um, opinions we hear are left opinions on how to improve education reform. Similar with healthcare, the only things you hear are left opinions on how to do healthcare reform. Mm -hmm. So what are the roadblocks right now on putting out things that are, we only hear about left opinions, how do we get the conservative opinions out there? You want to lead or you want me to lead? Oh, you can go ahead. You, you want to take it? I mean, really? I, I have lots of I'm, I'm, I'm just such a coward, though. I want to, want to. <laughs> well, no, well, you add. You add no, if look, you want to say Yeah, anything. yeah, well, okay, okay go ahead, go ahead. You, you're sure. talking about a distribution problem. Um, and this is where I think there's a lot of opportunity right now, um, because what's incredible is the demand is there. We know it's there. People are actively looking and asking for ways in which uh, um, to find the information that they, they want. Um, so I think, um, again, the benefit of digital technology is that even though we have this tyrannical you know, tech overlord situation uh, that's unfolding every day, which some of us have talked about for years, and now, of course, it's happening, uh, and uh, it's no surprise, um, but there's also people who realize that and are working on alternative uh, an alternative internet, let's call it. Many products, uh, many modes of distribution that will be off the grid, so to speak. There's a lot of opportunity there right now. There are people working on it. I think that the events of the last two weeks is, just will pour gasoline on that fire. I'm certainly all about doing this. Um, it's surprising how many people were already, were already working on it, but now it's a, kind of a matter of survival, of necessity. And um, I, I do have uh, some hope. I mean, part of the desperation that we're seeing is you have uh, a kind of corrupt oligarchy amongst you know, large corrupt structures. And they're freaking out a little bit because they recognize with Trump, the whole problem of Trump was, how could this happen? We were supposed to be in charge. This was not supposed to happen. We're supposed to ha be masters of the universe here. And this is someone you know, punching us in the face. So where did this come from? So this fury is that will never happen again and we're gonna have control over all the, all the information, and they are gonna keep going. I don't see anyone in Washington, D.C. who's gonna stop them outside of Trump, by the way. Frankly, I don't see any Republican who's actually gonna say any, do anything to stop what's going on. They had their chance, they haven't done it, and the foot's on the gas now, and they're not going to stop. But they are doing it out of a sense of desperation, and digital technology does allow you to create another network, right? It allows you, it allows you to get around uh, blockages, obstacles. And so I do have some hope there that we are going to be uh, creating that technology, and, um, and I, I very much want to further that, because we, we, we need to do it yesterday. It's a distribution problem, but it's also an analytic problem. You know, one of the things uh, in, in talking about what a conservative solution to policy area X is, is the assumption that there is a given conservative solution to it, mm -hmm. right? And so, and so the, the, the reality right now is that, is that the movement uh, in terms of its ideological composition is in a ton of flux. You know, you know traditionally, those of us who grew up uh, you know, and remember like Reagan, like, I remember Carter, by the way, uh, small, but <laughs> not a good memory. But, uh, but uh, you know, you know there, there's the assumption that, uh, that, you know, con that conservatism is basically you know, constituted by libertarianism uh, you know, mixed with aircraft carriers, basically, is kind of what the, is, is kind of what, like, the base conservative orthodoxy is. Which, which, which by the way, you know, when it's 1990 and 1989, you know, that, that, that's actually a really good and necessary orthodoxy. Um, I don't think we necessarily know what our orthodoxies are as a movement uh, in every particular sphere. You know, I've, I've got my ideas, which happen to be completely correct, uh, but you know, other, other, other people have, have, have others. You know, you think about, um, uh, uh, well, there's, there's a tweet that comes to mind 
uh, from an eminent conservative writer, and this individual is actually has done really good work, and so I'm not intending to you know, attack this person, but, 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 but this tweet came out uh, from this person, which was kind of this jaw-dropping tweet uh, in which, uh, in which uh, the, the, the tweet was specifically, um, uh, markets never fail us, we fail markets. And I read that, and I thought, what a ridiculous thing to say in Rust Belt, Ohio. Like, what a, what a, what a preposterous message to bring to South Bend, Indiana. You know, what, uh, what, what actually the faculty in Notre Dame would probably love it. But, uh, but, uh, th but, but, there's, but there's, you know, there, there's sort of this divorce, again, in institutional conservatism from, from the realities of American life. And, and, and the truth is, just to put my cards on the table, and I'm not saying this is the right solution, and there's plenty of people within the foundation who disagree with me, but uh, you know, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a conservative who thinks there you know is possibly a role for government in the state in some particular things. Uh, for those of you who got to hear Governor Perry speak last night, you know, he described two big things: screwworm eradication and uh, the creation of the farm to market road system. And you know, those two things for me personally fit squarely within my view of of what government ought to be doing. And so and so you know, we have to we have to adjudicate those. And then, and then derive our discrete policy solutions from, from, from the orthodoxies that we arrive at. And I think it's going to take uh, uh, many more years to come. We're just at the beginning of this process. I would just say real quickly in a sentence, I mean, what I said earlier applies in spades. The demand Next. is there. I mean, the kind of message that I think Josh is talking about, people are hungry for that. They will find it. I mean, they're, they're looking for someone to give them uh, something new, something that actually addresses the landscape they live in. Okay. Next question, sir, right there. Right there. And then, and then sir, you're, you're next. Okay. Yeah, you made, you made the observation that our division, there's a class division, and I wanted your thoughts on the division being the new economy versus the old economy. Mm -hmm. We're in the belly of the beast of Austin startup, mm -hmm. you know, new tech world, and it's, it's a thriving city, you know. I know we've got the homeless and the other crap going on, but, um, <laughs> but you've got that whole other side of our, our culture and economy, which I think is part of what Trump was appealing to, the people who, who got left behind. So yeah, your thoughts on how that plays into how we constitute, I think, the schisms in the conservative movement, as well as our, our political and economic you know, divides in the whole country are, are related to that. So your thoughts on new economy, old economy, and, and those divisions. Man, that, that, that's, a, that's a great question. It's probably one of the most important questions to ask. Uh, the, you know, as, as a conservative, you know, I don't think there's anything new under the sun. You know, human nature has stayed the same for thousands of years. but. Uh, you know, when you talk about the emergence of the data economy, you call it the new economy, or kind of this algorithmic economy that's emerging. I mean, I mean, there definitely is a division, and so the individuals who have been able to kind of hold on to that have zoomed upwards. I saw a figure. I think the number of data jobs since 2012 has increased something like 6,000 percent. So it's been crazy. Um, but the traditional pathway to dignity for the average person uh, has, has, you know, like the labor of your hands, the honesty of your work, uh, has has been in decline. Uh, my, my younger son, my four-year-old, uh, is, is named Thomas, and he's named after my great-grandfather, a guy named uh, Tomas Hidrogo, who grew up in Laredo. And Tomas Hidrogo, uh, it's on my mind because my father uh, uh, sent me a photograph of him actually last week, which you know kind of spurred tears, which I did not admit to my dad. Uh, but, uh, but, but I got this picture, and it's a picture of him and his wife and his daughter, my grandmother, uh, and, uh, and, then, and then two of his grandkids, is my, my dad and uncle. And, and, and I want to tell you about uh, Tomas Hidrogo, you know, a Texan, native-born Texan, uh, you know, Spanish-speaking uh, of Mexican ethnicity. Uh, uh, Tomas, uh, here, here's what he did professionally. He was a taxi driver. He had a vegetable stand in Laredo, and he did itinerant farm work um, uh, during, during the, 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 the harvest seasons, basically, and, you know, would range up to uh, Minnesota sometimes and, and things like that. And that's all he did, you know. And so, and so, but on that, he was able to build a house, literally build a house himself, uh, in Laredo, live in dignity, uh, have 13 children, uh, and, and raise them all, 11 of which uh, survived to adulthood. And he was beloved. He was the probably the, the, the wealthiest man uh, who ever lived, uh, in my opinion. Um, the little house at 990 Juarez uh, in Laredo still stands uh, today, and it's a testament to his work. Um, but he was able to do that and live that life of dignity with those modest jobs, because that was the kind of America that he lived in. You couldn't do that now. You couldn't do that now, and you couldn't, you couldn't have that trio of jobs, taxi driver, vegetable stand owner, an itinerant farm worker, and afford 13 kids. Build your own house. Have your own vehicle. Uh, it's gone. The people who can do that, you know, you talk about the new data economy, to which I'm, 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 an, I'm an enthusiastic proponent of it, right, because, because this is, this is uh, you know, it holds the potential for great human achievement. But the reality is that if we are implementing uh, and, and solidifying a divide in which people who master basic stats uh, and can code in R are up here, 
and everybody else who has only honest labor to offer is way down here. That's a long-term time bomb. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an incredibly important point because, and it goes to I mean, how you opened uh, the entire event, is what, that, what does that landscape look like? And all I can think of is, uh, is over and over again, I've been thinking about this summer, you, know, you imagine a, someone arriving in Southern California in the 1960s. I mean, I, I, I probably uh, I have a little bit of envy. You know, I think, how could it go wrong for you if you did that? <laughs> I mean, you'd have to work really hard not to get ahead, right? As long as you were working, I mean, I still like to joke um, and poke some of my friends in Orange County, California, and say, some of you guys think you're investors. You just bought a house. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> you just started buying property at the right time. I mean, but, but that was America. It was the, 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 entire, the entire situation, the entire landscape was different. And, uh, and so I, I really think addressing where we're at now is what's exceptionally important. And how that works out policy-wise, there's lots of debates we have to have. But we have to get out of, you know, policy is prudential. You create laws and policies to address a situation, not the other way around. And so we need to be a little bit more free and open and debate, you know, how to address what, what, what's going on in America now. But above all, the class, the class divide uh, comes down to the kind of rhetoric that gives people dignity who are in that situation where they're not part of the knowledge class. And what you see now is there's a lot of class rhetoric going on. You see the knowledge class, as we, we could call them, uh, you know, uh, just lashing out at these, this other half of America that is terrible and they all deserve to be canceled. And there's a lot going on there that has little to do with politics. Um, and, and the psychological aspect of this very much has to do with class. So I think as the Republicans uh, should very much be the workers' party and give dignity and, and address people uh, you know, with dignity. As, and all you have, that's all you have to do. And then you stand out from the other side at this point. I'll tell you, and unfortunately, we don't have time to get into this topic. But uh, if you want to really have a good lens to view this through, look at the perception and the rhetoric around Southern Americans in general, black and white, yeah. and Vietnamese, and Mexican, and other. Look at the rhetoric around the South, and you can see it uh, very, very starkly illustrated. Uh, we're on the sub five minute level, sir. You uh, may have the last question. Let's see. Oh, OK. Uh, so you're talking about? Uh, making a new set of parallel institutions. And we just saw Parler get kicked off their server farm. Now, the thing is, okay, we can build new server farms, but is it not true that the internet runs over trunk lines and that yep. companies like AT&T could just decide to cut trunk lines to uh, server farms? It, is that really, is it that easily, all this effort to build these parallel institutions, isn't that easily defeated by such a move? So yeah, so I, my, my mantra is uh, there's one part that I think will help uh, alleviate this problem. As new, new media, new tech, red states. And you need the red state part. You're gonna need, in other words, I mean, what, what Texas has already done has been very, very good uh, in going after some of these big tech companies, and more of that needs to happen. You're going to need the assistance of, uh, or the protection of, um, the, only, the only governmental institutions that uh, you know, we have uh, in order to accomplish some of these goals. And you're absolutely right. Uh, there's all kinds of ways in which you can you know, physically cut communication off. But what I would say is, uh, you know, there's another even more controversial outfit called Gab that was uh, destroyed already. And their only problem right now is just putting more servers on, online because they've already dealt with going off the grid for each of the other components of that business. I, I don't think it's, it's a, a cat and mouse game, but I don't think it's insurmountable. And at the same time, if you have at least uh, red states starting to fight uh, for constitutional rights, in this, uh, in this environment, you have a shot of, uh, of accomplishing something. Um, so, so you're right, I mean, we, but we need to, we need to think uh, you know, in a, a much bolder way about what's really needed because you're, you're thinking the right way. They, ultimately, they will be tempted to take measures, like you suggest, and cut cords. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you for your questions. Please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Matt Peterson for his time and insights.